everybody. How you doing? Well, that's good. You're listening to PHLY Post Game. My name is Bill Matz. I'm your director of Fun and Games for the evening. Man, that was uh, the most ridiculous game of the season by a lot. Uh, they fall down what, 5-1 in the Five first one. period. Carter Hart looks like he uh, didn't know where the net was behind him. Team had, I thought, a little bit of jump, but they just kind of fell flat after they gave up a bunch of goals and then came out in the second period and dominated most of the next 40 minutes, tie the game, take the lead, and then, uh, well, Carter Hart does his best Michael Layton impression uh, to give up the game tying goal 6-6, six, six, and then they eventually fall in the shootout. I, I got to be honest with you. Um I'm going to take a little bit of the blame for this one. Oh, really? I, or Are you? I decided to throw it back to 2010. Uh, and this is the hat from the oh. first Winter Classic in, uh, in Boston that the Flyers were in. So it's all your fault. And uh, You should not have done that in a game that Patrick, Patrick Kane was playing Kane in. Patrick Kane also decided to yeah. throw it back to 2010. Couple of goals in the first period. Uh, gets the winner in the shootout. And, of course... Carter Hart gives up the uh, the Leighton esque goal, but Charlie, this one was I mean this one was all over the place. Like I started and like okay they're down five one in the first and I just put in the outline. You were down at the uh, Festivus party, the Broad Street Hockey I Festivus was party tonight. Seems like it was a lot of fun. It was great uh, time. And I just put in the outline like all right let's do let's do dumb holiday shit. Like I'm gonna make a Christmas wish list, <laughs> something like that, because this game's gonna be pointless. Yeah, to, we're not gonna actually talk yeah, about the this game. This game's right? gonna be pointless to talk about. And then what ensues is absolute freaking madness. So I guess. Well, I guess where we want to start is with Carter Hart. Uh, plays for the first time in it's six, seven games. Uh, he's been out with this illness that's been bothering him. Comes back in tonight. And I just want to, you know, first period was a, was a disaster on all accounts. Yeah. And then as the game's going along, I'm like setting up the outline and going, all right, for Charlie's three stars, I always like to guess your three stars when you're not in the studio. Uh, and then see if I'm right. See if the comments, okay. commenters can see if I'm right. And I was like, honestly, I think Hart has earned his way maybe into the top three here with what he did in the final 40. And then there was uh, the then, final goal of regulation. And then, of course. And I guess the shootout, too, if you want to argue that. Yeah, so uh, the question I had was, is it more, was it more important tonight getting Hart a game before the break? Because he's been off for like two weeks five-day break coming up, was it just more important to like get him in there than maybe having a sharper, if not maybe a little more tired Samuel Airson? Maybe you keep Cal Peterson around just to have a professional goalie. We see how that worked with James well, Reimer tonight. Well. <laughs> like, what, what did you think of this decision and his, uh, his performance tonight? Look, he was very clearly rusty in the first period. That said, I didn't think he got a lot of help in the first period. No. The, the defense, there was that one goal, and I tweeted They're this standing out. Around it, it, was, it was a controller disconnected type of goal. The defense was somewhere between lacking and non-existent the entirety of the first period. As I tweeted out, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that first period intermission <laughs> because, holy shit, they came out like they all got whipped. That's in, like, in the locker room were by points, John Tortorella. Like there were points in the first where I was like, okay, they have good jump. Like they're not playing bad. And then it was just like they'd have those moments where it was where where'd everyone go? Yeah. Like and then okay, yeah. and, and then they scored because your goalie yeah. listen, you hung him out to dry, and also he hasn't played yeah, yeah, in yeah, forever. You, you hung him out to dry, and you had to know going into this game that this is a goalie who has not played in two weeks. He's going to be a little rusty. Maybe go out of your way to protect him, especially in the early stages of the game. The Flyers did the opposite of that, and they got exactly what one would expect when you don't protect your rusty goalie. In the first period of a game when he hasn't played in two weeks, he got shelled. And I, look, I fully expected this game was over once they were down five to one. Again, I have no idea what John Tortorella said to the team in the locker room after the first period. I imagine he may have torn some things off the wall and maybe there is some paint that used to be there that is no longer there anymore. But from the first shift of the second period, it was abundantly clear that like this was... I have to imagine this was the Peter Laviolette 
you know, you better rip your heart out of your fucking your fucking chest, and otherwise, you're not gonna like your ice time. It was that on steroids because you had like Travis Sandheim get a breakaway within like 30 seconds. It was it was immediate. <laughs> like the difference. While I don't think like they were horrible for the whole first 20 minutes, obviously you give up five goals, you were very bad. Oh yeah, uh, like you, you were bad, and then it was immediate from the start of the second period. They took over the game. Um, I guess now is the time I have to. Uh, you wouldn't have picked this, but my guess for first star of the game. Okay. It was the Toyota turning point tonight. <laughs> Nick Sealer, baby. I mean, Nick Sealer sparked this comeback. It was so what was very funny was the fact it that we his... it was the fact that we clipped the Secret Santa thing. And I went on here and I said that Nick Sealer is the nicest, <laughs> the nicest guy in the Flyers guy. locker room. And then we see that video of him just absolutely reaming out the official for justifiably so it like it seems like what happened was the official originally did not call a major on the other guy then after sealer yelled at him he threw sealer out of the game and then was like oh he's actually right you're still out of the game but i'm gonna call the major on the other guy it was so, like because in that situation <laughs> i expect john tortorella to be losing in his mind and what they showed on the broadcast was him just going why why yeah like over yeah. and over and that's a great question and it was like yeah because nothing really ever got announced and like boosh and uh and jj were perplexed and then like, well it's not a five minute major penalty so i guess they called the major no well, that was very clearly why sealer was angry at least yeah. it seemed like it watching the broadcast that the reason why sealer was mad was not because he got called for a five minute major he clearly fought he probably was fine with the instigator because he did instigate the fight but the idea that the other guy was not going to get called for a major and the Flyers are going to have to kill off a five-minute or a seven-minute penalty, I guess. I'll tell you. By the letter of the law, okay, it's instigation. Yeah, by the letter of the law, it's an instigation. It's instigation. Penalty. On a delayed penalty, when you finish your hit high like that, you have instigated a fight. Mm. This is like in NHL, like in the NHL video game where it's like there's an automatic fight after you shoot after the whistle. This is do you think he wasn't gonna fight you? Like yeah. this is a situation, and the league has made a point recently, and this wasn't, I don't think it was like a boarding or a bad hit from behind or anything like we've seen running rampant the last couple weeks in the NHL. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't a clean play. No. Nah. And the league wants players clearly, because they're asking them to, police yourselves. We're not going to suspend guys for five and six games, so police yourselves. Nick Sealer did exactly that, and he got kicked out for it. I just thought that was— I think he got kicked that out. That was a miss— but, but he got, he that was got a misapplication of justice. It absolutely was. He got kicked out for yelling at the referee. For getting for, the call wrong. For getting the call wrong, which, like, yes— that's justifiable. However, it was very clearly an example of someone where, like, you know when you when you get into a fight with a friend and you know the friend is right and you change your behavior because the friend was right, but you're still mad at the friend for being the one to yes. yell at you for it? That was that. That was that play. <laughs> it, it, the whole thing was absolutely ridiculous, but the Flyers very much responded after that. And I know we often joke about, like, you know, we I always call it the Brandon Manning fight. Ah, team's down 4-1. Just start swinging. You'll be in the lineup next game. What the hell? But, like, Nick Sealer, one, is in no... No, uh, no, he's in no danger. No of danger of coming out of, out of the lineup yeah. anytime soon. Uh, and also, he's just... Like, I, I just thought that was a great move. Like, it's 5-1. Why yeah, not? I'm going to start no, swinging. And, and, that's, that's what hockey was for 100 years, and it isn't anymore, but it clearly and, still and is. And also, if you're Nick Sealer, okay, and I agree, there's no chance that Nick Sealer is going to get scratched. However, you're Nick Sealer. Your head coach is John Tortorella. You know that he is going to eat that shit up. Oh, if they won, <laughs> if they won tonight, there's not a doubt in my mind he's wearing the dog mask. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, uh, I did my big takeaway from that whole because they score right after it, and then the comeback is on. Had. Danny B started making calls immediately after that fight. You get a first round pick for next year. <laughs> there's not a doubt in my mind. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that like, cause the game changed. So Th this game changed. So much. I do want to go back for a second to Carter Hart. Okay. Yes. Because I do think, so what I will say about Carter Hart's game, I will say that first period, he was clearly rusty. Second period, the flyers, second and third period, really the flyers pretty much controlled it. I do mostly agree with Brian Boucher 
I know Brian Boucher is a goalie. He's used to this. Carter Hart, honestly, on that on that sixth goal, he did what goalies are essentially taught to do these days. It was a, a reverse vertical horizontal. That is the play. That is the the, the structure. That is the, the setup that a goalie is told to do in that situation. He gives up a goal. Is it a weak goal? Absolutely. But it's a weak goal because as a goal, you are told that 99 times out of 100, if you go into that structure, you are not going to allow a goal. It happened to be that one time out of 100 that it went through. Does it make Carter look, look like shit? Absolutely. And sure, you can criticize for him. You can criticize him for it. Maybe, maybe the the four wasn't quite deep enough to get into the the RVH as uh, as, as Bush called it. But I totally understand why Hart got into that position. It's what that, they're told that's to do because it's the highest percentage. That, that is what they are told to do. It ends up just sucking for the Flyers in that they give up the goal after they came back and take the lead six five. I'm not going to give him too much shit for that goal. In overtime, he was fantastic. And then in the shootout, I think we just may have to accept that Carter Hart is not a good shootout goalie. So I feel like you're setting me up to ask the dumb question. Yes, I want to ask this question. Because we have seen Samuel Harrison have such success in the shootout, the only guy to beat him thus far in nine attempts is TJ Oshie. He's a cheat code, so that doesn't even count. Yeah. In my mind, he's eight for eight. Agreed. Um, could there ever be a Julie the Cat Gaffney situation where you go four, uh, like four minutes are gone in overtime and you look over at Sam and go, start stretching? <laughs> I Could like, you ever see it I, happening? I, see, the thing is, is that while it breaks all the rules of having a cold goalie, which if you remember, the announcer in the Junior Goodwill Games does say, he brought it up. you bring in a cold goalie to face the highest scorer in the tournament, it's a bold strategy, Cotton. We'll see if it pays <laughs> off for it. Just mixing movies all together I sure have. It's tremendous. I will say, However, however what, what I will say about that is that I, do, I don't think a coach, an NHL coach, would ever do it. However, I do wonder... In a shootout, it is such a it's it's a mental thing. It is a battle of wits. And I do wonder how much it would throw off the other team if you switch goalies in the middle of the shootout. I have I, I'm the one who posed the question. You, and like, you, I be, would to, love it. To, to be clear, I would, to be clear no one's going ever going to do it. it is never However, I do wonder if you, even though you will obviously have the negative of the cold goalie who is just not ready to face anything, I do wonder if some of that is outweighed by the fact the other team would just be like, what in the actual shit is going on? Uh, like my, If we were to debate this on, like, say this is a serious conversation. Yes. Am I, and I'm the one who posed the question, so I'm countering it, but the two things are, one, if a coach did that and Samuel Harrison tears his groin. Oh, yeah. And we already know, like, they have no confidence in Felix Sandstrom. Clearly. Cal Peterson stinks. I think like, that was part of the reason why. Here. I think, but you, you mentioned, like, you're should, out of a job. You mentioned, should they have started Carter Hart? I think one of the reasons why they started Carter Hart in this game is, a, is, is because a rusty Carter Hart is still better than Cal Peterson. And, <laughs> and like, they know that. And two, especially in this dynamic where your presumed franchise goalie is the one who is weaker in this situation than the clear backup, at least to this point. Sure. Imagine Carter Hart's reaction. Now, I know you, this isn't like this isn't like minor. This isn't Little League. Like we're not <laughs> out here to protect feelings. Yeah. But... If your franchise goalie, like, you know, the Montreal Canadiens one time left Patrick Waugh in, the greatest goalie of all time, top three, to take on seven or nine goals or whatever it is, and came back to the bench said, never playing for you again. Yeah, bye. And he never played for them. <laughs> so, like, and I, I, like, this is Patrick Waugh who'd won two cups versus... Yeah, you, you, I'm just saying. Yeah, he I don't had, think he had a little would, bit higher status than Carter Hart at the moment. I don't think you would do that to your franchise goaltender. Um, let's do it now. Uh, calling all card collectors. I didn't even have it in front of me. Beautiful. <laughs> Where to go? Uh, calling all card collectors. Wheelhouse is our go-to sports card gift and apparel shop in the Delaware Valley. Their motto is cards and community because love of sports unites us all. They carry all of your favorite card brands like Topps Chrome Baseball and Mosaic Football as well as 
T-shirts, hats, and hoodies from brands like Mitchell and Ness, 47 Brand, Junk Food, Starter, and Shy Vintage Sports. Maybe you're looking to grade your own sports card collection. Wheelhouse offers PSA grading submissions. They also host tons of family-friendly events and birthday parties every month. So stop into either of their stores in Wayne or Westchester, open seven days a week at 11 a.m., and use code PHLY and get $10 off any purchase of $20 or more in the store. Also be sure to give them a follow on Instagram at Wheelhouse Cards. Christmas a couple days away. You have missed it. You have missed the deadline for online shopping. It's over for you. You want to get that cool yeah, gift. You, you better go to the brick yeah. and mortar. <laughs> you want to get that cool <laughs> gift. You have to get your ass up. Go to Wheelhouse Cards. You won't regret it. And use code PHLY, $10 off. All right. Um, so I guess I wanted to talk about. There's a, so much to talk about I, I in this game. I'm it's, legitimately curious what you're going to bring up. It, it, this is just like my thoughts from the beginning of the game, and we're just going to kind of go in order and see how my brain worked throughout the, uh, throughout watching I this. I mean, we're both drinking beer right now, so we've talked. Cheers. Of, cheers. It's our <laughs> last show to like Wednesday, but yeah, right? uh, we've talked about Sandheim specifically and the coaching staff wanting to give him that break. Just get him to this holiday break. Let him give a little rest. They've, Pulled back on his ice time a little. With what we saw, I guess more last night and then the beginning of tonight's game, do you think maybe the whole team's just kind of beat? Now, obviously, they make this furious comeback. They leave it all out there. They have five days off, so that makes sense. But do you think there was a little anticipating the holiday? I mean, you talk to anyone who's got like a regular job this time of year. It's like, this is a fake work week. Like, ain't I no mean, one, ain't agreed, no one doing agreed. shit. <laughs> and, you know, like, what, what do you, last night and then the beginning of tonight's game, what do you attribute that to? Yes. Yeah. Uh, honestly, in the first period, especially, it looked like a team that, they looked to me like a team that in the first period was perfectly happy losing this game like three to one. Where they would have been like, you know what? Let's, let's like, like, let's just let's put in the effort. Let's let's not kill ourselves. We we don't have to win this game. We've played three and four nights. Detroit had the night off last night. We traveled. Like this was a schedule loss. This is a game that, looking at the schedule, you expect the Flyers to lose. The first period Flyers team that showed up looked to me like a team that was content to lose this game close. And then they played so bad in the first period because of that, that I think Tortorella just absolutely killed them. And then they decided, you know what, like we might never play another hockey game again <laughs> if we don't come out in the second period and just completely drain the reserves. Like I honestly think that's my, that, that might've been what happened. Like I'm not saying that the Flyers came in with that intention in their heads, but we've all been there. Like, that's the thing when when I hear people get really, really angry at professional athletes about, you know, oh, man, they just had a bad game. Like, how could they? How could they have such a bad game? They're a professional athlete. They're played to play a sport. They're paid to play a sport. You know what? We've all had those days. Like, we've all had those work days where we just don't, we're just not at our best, where we had a bad night's sleep. You know, we, we stayed up too late the night before. We were scrolling on Twitter, or watching too many YouTube videos, and, or, you know, something bad happened in our personal life or whatever. And the next day, we're just like only 60% focused. I got the sense in that first period, the Flyers were not 100% focused. And what that first period reminded you of is the fact that this team ain't that good. And if they are not focused, they are going to get their doors blown off. Now, if they are focused and they're playing as a cohesive whole, which they did largely over the final 40 minutes of this game, they can do what they did, which is come back from five to one. But I'm almost looking at this team now. I'm looking at this team and saying, this is a team with a very low floor and a pretty high ceiling because when they are not giving their all, they can lose to the winless San Jose Sharks. When they are giving their all, they can beat like the Vegas Golden Knights and the Carolina Hurricanes and the New Jersey Devils. And it was like, there was a little bit of, um, 
uh, this game, like the Sharks game, yes, they lost. Also, I thought they outplayed them a lot in that game, and it was just like fair. Eventually, they were going to win. Now but, that's no excuse. But but also, eventually, they were going to get a save. This is coming from the guy who spent the first uh, twenty minutes of that show destroying. I, oh no, there's no excuse. Like <laughs> I don't care. Like what was due for what and regression. Like you beat the team that has no wins because they have no fucking wins. Right. But like tonight was kind of just that reminder of what they're missing because the big difference in the first period other than just like mental breakdowns and the goaltending yeah. to me was Larkin to bring it Kane fair they had absolutely it looked like a power play when those guys were on the ice they had absolutely no answer they were skating circles around them if anyone's worried about the uh hip resurfacing surgery and how Kane's yeah, he, responding he to good, it right. at least he looked uh, pretty damn good tonight. Yeah, he did. Uh, and he's out there with, you know, Larkin and Debrinket, so it's not like he has to do all the heavy lifting. Just like, hey, guy who can score all the goals. <laughs> score us some goals. Score yeah. us some goals. And he did tonight. So, yeah, I, do you think the Flyers' style of play – they, obviously, they've overachieved quite a bit this season. They've been playing over their heads. Now, maybe they can continue this, find a new level, but they've overachieved. Yeah, and I, their I style think we're, of we're play – is fucking tiresome. <laughs> like, let's block every shot, and then let's try to get odd man rushes. That <laughs> seems tiring. Um, are we just in for nuts, nights like this sometimes, where it's, and like stretches like this, where, yeah, two games in a row, they just don't have it. Most nights they do, but it's real hard to do this 82 times. Probably. Uh, honestly, but I don't even necessarily think it's that they're not giving it their all. I just think that my view of this Philadelphia Flyers team is that they are not as talented as most of the teams they're going to play against. And because of that, they're going to have nights where they struggle. And I think that that is the true talent level of this team. Maybe this team can hang in the playoff race and maybe they can make the playoffs. They are, I, I don't know exactly where they land now. I know there's like a, a thing where it's like an 80% chance or something like that if you're in a playoff spot. I assume they still are because they seem like they were in a pretty good spot. I don't know where they are in terms of point percentage, though. However, I do think that there is an element with this team where they're when they play most teams that they're battling for a playoff spot with, they're going to have a talent deficiency and they are going to need to overcome that by just outworking and and not just saying outworking because I don't want to just say this is all about hard work. It's also about the, the level of commitment to the system. The Flyers so far this year against most teams have executed what John Tortorella wants them to do better than the other team has executed what their coach wants them to do. And that's not just effort. That's that's execution. That is knowing what you want to do. That is preparation. And that is skill. So I'm not, I, I don't want to dismiss that. However, I do think that as the season progresses, they're going to have games against more teams that know that they are in a battle for a playoff spot and they're probably going to have games with higher leverage because those games just matter more and presumably the teams that are battling for a playoff spot are going to be sharper in february which is the point that tortorella was making after the tuesday game they're going to be sharper in february than they were in november and december and it's going to be harder for the flyers to do what they're doing now against them that's and torts said like in this league you really don't know what your team is until late January when teams really start to tighten it up. Yeah. And tonight was a great example of like, we got a f both teams. It really seemed like we got a five day break coming up. Our coaches are contractually restricted from punishing us. Yeah. So we're going to play run and gun as much as we can. There was so little defense played tonight. It was tremendous. Now that's really good hockey to me. Uh, but the Flyers scored a bunch of their goals in transition. I don't know if the forecheck uh, that was criticized by John, John Tortorella actually improved tonight. Uh, but I thought I'm, the, I'm actually very curious I to track the, this game. I, I, I want to see what it comes out. The level of effort in the offensive zone was higher, if not like more sustained possessions, I don't think. But just what I was seeing out of them, the way they scored all their goals was getting their asses to the net, getting deflections, yeah. getting screens, getting rebounds. And that was awesome. There, there's also one thing I do want to point out and like, Look, credits of the Flyers, they they pushed, they came back in the second and the third, they really showed a lot of energy, they showed a lot of fight, they showed all the fight that wasn't there in the first. However, I do want to make this point, they don't come back 
if James Reimer plays like an NHL goalie. I mean, <laughs> like, I will, let's be honest oh, here. No, that's 100% true. I will grant you that. Carter Hart's play in the first period, I think, negates it. Like, mm, Hart is, right. uh, Hart's a better goalie than James Reimer. And if this was a normal game, it would be like, well, Hart just sucked. Like, tonight it was, we're getting him in because we don't want him to have, like, a month off. So he's going to get in and take his lumps early. And then he was excellent, except for the huge blunder late. And the shootout. Um, and then the shootout. Which is just him. The shootout's the shootout. That's it, just him. It, it yeah. is what it is. Score a goal and maybe you help him. It's James, like, that's the other end of this, like, it was James Reimer in there during the shootout, yeah, too. Yeah, somebody's like, got to score. Maybe score on him. He sucked all night. That's a really good like, point. I, I don't want to put it all on hard yeah, on that one. Yeah, a really good point. Um, so the four check, I, I don't know if it actually improved tonight, but I did like their effort in the offensive zone better. I do have to just ask you this question about something they do. Okay. Why are they so dependent on the lobs into the neutral zone? It seems like they're doing it more like this last over, week over or the two. last like week or two. Yeah. yeah, it seems like it's become more of a thing. I I did see them practicing it at in Voorhees. I think it was earlier this week they were all trying it. Look, they do want to have guys leaving the zone a little bit earlier. That's part of their strategy. That's part of the the changes they've made. Tortorella is not punishing guys for leaving the zone a little bit early if they think the Flyers are about to win control of the puck and they can possibly attack and transition. So that's part of it. However, there's a fine line between taking advantage of those opportunities and becoming like the... And I, I know this is a tough comparison to make because he was also the Flyers head coach, but I'm thinking back to like the Elaine Vigno New York Rangers teams at the end where it seemed like their entire way of creating offense was trying to create breakaways. They were just like, oh, we're just going to spend 80% of the game in the defensive zone and then flip pucks out of the neutral zone and hope that Carl Hagelin can score a breakaway goal and the rest of the game we're just going to depend upon Henrik Lundqvist to stop everything. Like, And I think this goes back to what Tortorella, the point he was making after Tuesday's game, is that the Flyers, while... He wants them to attack. He wants them to play a rush-oriented game. He doesn't want them to start skewing too far in the direction of let's base our entire offense around scoring off the rush. And I do think he's a little bit worried that they've started to skew in that direction. Now, this game was just a shit show all around. I mean, so I don't even know how to evaluate this game no, in, in the sense of that. But I do think that the Tuesday game was very much a, or the Thursday game was very much a, um, yeah, the Thursday game. I, I'm sorry, I'm mixing yes. up days. Yeah, because today's Friday, they played yesterday. The Thursday game was very much an example of the Flyers. Most of the players thinking every time they had the puck, at the edge of their own zone thinking, you know what? I'm feeling great about myself. I can carry this through the neutral zone. I'm not going to turn it over. It's fine. And that's what Tortorella doesn't want them to, to believe. I, I just, I guess that's the disconnect for me is I see video of them practicing their lobs yeah. and th like hear the coach saying this, it's not going to work all year. Like teams are going to tighten up. Eventually this is going to become like NHL hockey again. And you know, it, it happens every year. It's not going to work, but it appears to be their strategy. So like, I, I, I don't think the lob is their strategy. I do think that the transition rush is their strategy, but I think the point that Tortorella is trying to make is that while I want you to attack off the rush more, if a team is going to like we've seen this we saw this the the year that the capitals won the cup the capitals just sat back in a one three one and dared teams to come through the neutral zone against them and they rode that all the way to a fucking stanley cup and i think what the point tortorella is making is look i want you guys to attack i do not want you guys to turn back into a dump and chase centric team however if you're playing against a team that is sitting back in the neutral zone and daring you to attack them, you know, like to attack right into the teeth of a stationary neutral zone forecheck that is built to stop you from carrying the puck through the middle of the ice. Maybe don't just keep doing that. And I think the Flyers over the last few games have started to fall into that trap. And I think that's what he was trying to push. I wrote that in my article after the game. That's what he was trying to push after that game is that, look, guys, I want us to be an attacking rusher on a team, but there's limits. And we're reaching those limits right now. Yeah, it was like, and I get uh, like the, just the lob play in general. Like I love um, every time the defenseman 
gets the puck, you know, somewhere between the hash marks and his own blue line, his head's up. Like, yeah. it's exciting. Yeah, it's it is. It's like when Absolutely. Jalen Hurts drops back and you're like, oh, he's looking deep. Yeah. You know, like, I can hear Merrill making the yeah, call like, almost. Like, oh, 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 oh where, like where's, where's A.J. Brown? <laughs> and it's been, it's been their most effective offense. They score most of their goals off of the rush. And if teams are going to just sit back and basically play, like, the too high safety like you're talking about, all right, how do we create a rush in that situation? Lob it up, and now all it takes is win a battle, you poke it through, and it's 2-1-1. One, one. I get it. It's just... It seems to be their strategy. I don't, uh, but it's working for the most part. I just don't know how much longer it's going to continue to work. You know, they scored, they tied their season high in goals tonight with six. Uh, Look, Bill, I'm skeptical that this is all going to keep working. So, <laughs> all right. So the, the lob is just a small part of why I'm skeptical that the Flyers are going to keep winning as enough. many games as they've been winning. Fair enough. It's just something I've taken note of over the last couple of days. Something you should take note of. It's where to get your bagels, baby. You got to go to Bagels and Company. They were our presenting sponsor for the Reading Terminal show early this week. Uh, you saw me take a bite of one on the air. It was actually, really good. Bagels. It was actually delicious. Re really good. Uh, bagels, I ate a yeah. dry, like untoasted, <laughs> unsmeared bagel, and it was very tasty. I'm totally fine with. Like, so my my thing with bagels is that look, I prefer them to be toasted. But as long as you put something good on the bagel, I'm happy to have a bagel on toasted. If you want to get some delicious Brooklyn style bagels made with Philly love, Hell you yeah. got to do it from Bagels and Company. Uh, they have the largest cream cheese variety, 30 different flavors of cream cheese and schmears. That's very important. Obviously, I just you know shoved one in my mouth the other day, but yeah, you probably want <laughs> something on your bagel. If you have a huge selection of bagels like they do, you're going to want a huge selection of cream cheese as well. They've got Got it for you uh, for the best Brooklyn style bagels made right here in Philly. Head to the bagel, <laughs> the bagels and co.com slash store dash locator to find the closest bagels and co near you. They wrote out the whole like <laughs> uh, web address. I was like, <laughs> what does this say? It's just a hyperlink. I now have to read it, but yeah, bagels and co. Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. Bagels and co.com. You go there, get awesome bagels. I'm going to have some for a uh, house uh, for an open house party. I'm having for all my friends tomorrow and their families. They're going to love it. I can't wait to show them bagels and co. You got to show your friends and family them as well. All right, Charlie, where do we go next? Ah, Morgan Frost is someone I wanted to bring up tonight. Sure. Let's uh, talk about yeah. Morgan Frost. Uh, well, <laughs> why not? I, I said last <laughs> night I liked his process on the fluke goal. Even though it's a fluke, I liked everything he did leading up to it. And when you do the right things, even if it's, as Andrew and I were calling it uh, earlier, like it's a... Uh, it's a video game glitch, <laughs> like the way he scored that goal. Yeah. Uh, he, everything he did leading up to it was right, so sometimes you get lucky. You even included him amongst your three stars of the game last night. Tonight, uh, he gets the third goal by going to the net. And uh, he's calling for the puck. He's open down low. He absorbs contact again but makes the play. Do you? I, I've already said I've given up because it doesn't matter if he's good or not. The team doesn't care. So he's only in because Noah Cates is hurt. In this opportunity he's getting now when they don't have any other forwards they want to play, at least. If we were to do the Christmas wish list, I'd be talking about Samu Tuamala, but we're not there yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you think he might be able to establish something with this team where his ceiling with them, which I thought was on the ground is raised a little. I've never fully given up on the idea of Morgan Frost being part of this team because I don't think, while I agree with you, that John Tortorella has probably made the decision in his head that he doesn't see Morgan Frost as part of this long term, I do not think that the organization as a whole has made that decision. I think the way that people like Danny Briere are viewing the situation with Morgan Frost is that, as we've seen right now, Noah Cates is injured. Torts has no choice right now but to play Morgan Frost. And they believe enough in his talent that they think that Morgan Frost will convince the coach, who they believe has an open enough mind to change his mind about players, that Morgan Frost deserves to be part of this long term. I think Morgan Frost had a pretty good game tonight. I, obviously, he scores the goal, but he also had legitimately really good underlying metrics. Looking at the... Uh, the on ice expected goals metric for him at five on five. He was actually second on the team with a 73.93% uh, on ice expected goal share at five on five behind only uh, our good pal Garnet Hathaway, who, man, can, uh, 
let, let, let's talk a few more minutes about Morgan Frost, but I want to talk about Garden Hathaway Absolutely. because, man, he's fun. He's, uh, he's great. <laughs> but I, I, look, I think Morgan Frost, and I've made this point quite a few times on the show, because of what I see as his inherent limitations as a, as a player, I think he has to score a lot to convince the people in the organization that he deserves to be part of this. But I do not want to rule out the possibility that he doesn't have the skill to score that much. If he can establish him as himself as a yearly 60 point a year guy, if that's who he is, then the Flyers got to find a way to make him fit because you can't be just tossing those guys out for no reason. I still think in the end that three years down the road, he's not going to be here. That's my guess. But I don't think it's as black and white as you've presented it, where it's just a matter of time before he gets straight. I think there's still a chance that Morgan Frost could carve out a long-term spot for himself in this organization. I do. I I would like to believe that that's a possibility because it means Danny Briere has as much or more influence over what actually happens than the coach. I think John Tortorella is in charge. That's and so because okay. of, and I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just I see this as kind of a if not he's in charge a 50 50 situation, and if he's going to you know like Bill Parcells said be the one making dinner, he's going to be the one picking out the groceries. <laughs> uh, like and fair. Uh, whether he's right or wrong about Morgan Frost, I think his mind is made up. But I'm starting to see some things out of Morgan Frost that I I don't. I don't know if I believe in him either. Like, I might be closer to John Tortorella than Danny Briere on the Morgan Frost scale. Uh, but he's starting to show me some things that open the door for the possibility, like you're saying. I don't I don't know. Like, he's got two goals in two games. Great. He's also hasn't really produced a ton this year. That's true. Like, he has not looked like the guy in the final 55 no. games of last no, season. No, no. It's reasonable to say that even though I think by the eye test— in my mind, Morgan Frost over the last few weeks has looked pretty good. Yeah. I, I think he's made plays. I think he's had quite a few legitimately good games. However, if Morgan Frost is going to be a part of this long term, he can't just pass the eye test because he doesn't bring the same things to the table that, you know, I'm not even talking about an Owen Tippett. Owen Tippett obviously brings the fact that he's a power forward and can also score a lot to the table. But even like a Noah Cates, Noah Cates is a guy who you can trust to shut down the other team with two minutes left in a game. Morgan Frost is never going to be that guy. If Morgan Frost is going to be a every night in the top nine NHL player on a cup contender, he has to score a lot of points. I think he theoretically has the talent to do so. However, since Noah Cates has been out, he has not scored a ton of points. He scored some points. He scored a goal tonight. He's had some points. He's been fine. I think he has to be better than fine if he wants to be part of this long term. All right, it's Garnett Hathaway time because this dude, while I will give, <laughs> while I am giving Nick Sealer the credit for the comeback, uh, and it's a damn shame they didn't finish thing, this thing off tonight. And I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to come on here and be like mad after the show. Yeah. Cause like when they're down 5 1 after the first, I'm like, all right, I got to get in character. Not really. Like it's the last show for, <laughs> for like, uh, like 10 day or eight days, whatever it is. Like, I don't know. But I just, I don't want to have our Christmas show be me mad. You know, I'm wearing this hat, wearing this sweat. I don't. It, so at least they did that. But hey, I'll give Sealer the credit for the comeback. But if I'm going to give an assist, Garnet Hathaway got the boys going tonight. Uh, it starts with the big hit in the neutral zone. God, I, that was such a good hit. I thought that at first, like in real time, it was like cutting away, and I just thought it was two guys who ran into each other. And then they show the replay. Oh, I know why Detroit was pissed. It was a clean hit. Oh, yeah. But he fucking wrecked him, and he did it on purpose. No, it, it was a clean hit, but it was a vicious hit. Yeah. It was no, a vicious he hit. He had ill intention. <laughs> sure he did. Not, I'm sure he did he, not mean to injure him. He wanted to hurt but him. But he wanted to hurt he him. He wanted to hurt him, yeah. absolutely. No, that was, and that's hockey, baby. But yeah. uh, Garnet Hathaway, and then, like, in the scrum after the fact, like, this is the thing about the instigator penalty to me. The Flyers will never draw one because they are a team of dudes who are ready to go. Like, oh, you want to drop your gloves? Mine are already off, dummy. <laughs> yeah, right. You fucked up. <laughs> like, the, like the Hathaway fight early where he hit the guy and they came and he was like, oh, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was in the Colorado. I don't remember what game. But tonight, uh, in that scrum, 
<laughs> he is punching two dudes. <laughs> he's throwing body shots. He's throwing around the other guy to get to the dude behind him. And he scores a goal tonight. Um, Bill, I told you. I love Garnet Hathaway. Bill, I, I told you in, in training camp you did. about Garnet you Hathaway. Did. I was like, look, I do not know if the signing of Garnet Hathaway is the most intelligent thing for a team in the midst of a rebuild in terms of make, you know blocking spots for the kids. I don't know. It might not be. What I do know based on how much I had watched Garner Hathaway, because I'd watched Garner Hathaway a fair amount. He was a guy who I always admired from afar as a guy where, hey, if my team's good, I want him on my fourth line. He was one of those guys for me. And when they signed him, I was like, you know what? Maybe not the smartest thing for a rebuild. But for people like me and Bill who have to watch <laughs> every single Flyers game, I am pumped they signed Garner Hathaway because he is a damn fun hockey player. And he is a damn fun hockey player. I think I expected a little more offense, but I just looked up his, uh, his career splits. And the reason I expected that Five goals in 26 games in his career against the Flyers. Uh, there's only one team he scored more against. It's Columbus. He also has 11 points against the Flyers. That's the most of any team. He's beaten them up a little bit. That's maybe why I expected a little more offense from him. Fair. But also, the line he's on, what can I really expect? <laughs> <laughs> and, but like tonight, that fourth line was absolutely buzzing. Scott Lawton played one of his best games yeah. of the year so far. Yeah. Nick Delorier actually had an impact for the first time in a while. Like That line was good tonight. And that leads me, I guess, if we're talking about Garnett Hathaway and, and that fourth line, Scott Lawton was very good tonight. He was. I think he had two points. He's going to be one of my um, stars of the game. He, I think he had a goal and an assist. He did. Uh, he was all over the place, and this is the kind of game you kind of need a dude like Scott Lawton. If it's going to be a shit show, I want Scott Lawton on the ice. And he always does kill the Red Wings. Yes. That, I think they said it's his eighth goal in, in his nine last games. nine games in against the, the Red Wings. Games. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, he kills them. Um, I, that line played well. They actually made an impact for the first time in a little bit, I'd say. They started the year great, and it kind of sagged. But we talked the other day, once Lawton maybe gets it going a little, is he, all right, paling back to the fourth, Lawton back up. Do you want to see that happen? Or do you want to kind of see what them roll with this? Because it's working a little right now. Well, By working, I mean they were good tonight, well, even though they lost seven to fucking six. Look, this was the first game in a while. And by a while, I mean like about two or three weeks yeah. where we saw the good version of Scott Lawton. I would like to see a few more games okay. of the good version of Scott Lawton before I am ready to move him back up the lineup. And look, we had this debate earlier this week. We've had so many shows. I don't remember which day I it was, but we've had a lot of shows this week. I said that I expect that Scott Lawton will get it back going. Tonight, he got it back going. However, this is just one game. I want to see. And it kind of sucks because now they're going to have a five-day break. Who knows if he's going to be carried over. But at least this reminds him that he's a good hockey player and he can do these sorts of things. This just struck me as such a Scott Lawton type of game. Oh, where yes. this was a game that was like entirely fueled by vibes. And Scott Lawton is like the most vibe hockey player it's, on the Flyers. It's why he's still here. Yeah. It's why other teams want him. Yeah. Like this sort of game. Uh, I guess I also have to talk about the blue line a little. Um, Travis Sanheim, 25-40 tonight. Obviously, like Nick Sealer gets kicked out, so you're down they a guy. They played it overtime, too, yeah, they, so that it goes, They play 65 minutes. Yep. They don't have Sealer. He only plays 8-24 before he gets booted. So it makes sense. And it's the last game before the break. Like, they wanted to get him here. but Last game of the year, Brent. You can't can't back, back now. now. <laughs> uh, but a couple of assists. And he looked... I've probably said this way too many times this year, but he looked as strong as I've seen him in a little bit. Like, the play hasn't been where it was to start, uh, but he's been good. Tonight, I thought he was all, like, purposefully assertive. Like, going, all right, if this is the type of game it's going to be, if it's going to be an up-and-down game, guess who can do that? Me. I'm huge. I can skate. I can puck handle. I am going to have an impact on this game. Five shots on goal, two assists, a couple of penalty minutes, two hits. Sanheim, I keep expecting the disaster game. Mm -hmm. Like, we had the Ottawa. The, it was really just the play in Ottawa. Like, it wasn't a good game overall, but it's, okay, 
that Drew, it was Drew, a it was a classic Travis it was Sanheim just the play. Sanheim yeah. when he makes a mistake, it's a disaster. And it was like, yeah, Drew took him to school a little bit. Also, Drew's one of the best puck handlers I've ever seen. Yeah. So like, I think Drew's what, a Hall of Fame yeah, player. Like, what's gonna happen? He probably should have won a Selkie in his career at some point. Um, I. I haven't seen a huge dip in Sanheim. I know they've backed off his minutes, but tonight he plays over 25. Is he really going to keep this going? Like, I, I don't believe it, but he hasn't he hasn't slowed down. I think if Sanheim keeps playing with the assertiveness that he has been playing with, yeah. Because I think that is that is his ceiling. When he believes in his own physical abilities... He can be this every night. I, I honestly, the, the Sandheim was a fascinating player for me tonight because I thought that he, he actually, I mean, you're, you're stealing my three stars here. He was going to be the other flyer who I put in the three stars we'll in next. addition to Scott Lawton. But I thought Sandheim was horrible in the first period. Now, granted, the whole team was, but I thought he was really, really bad. But the... His first shift in the second period when he almost scores off that sort of breakaway, like that was when you just realize like, oh, oh, they're not going to pack it in tonight. And I guess a weird part of me, like, and, and I've always been a very public Travis Sanheim defender. I've been a believer in his game. I never thought that he would be the guy who did the thing the that had everyone else be like, yeah, we're not out of this. Like, I, I always thought of Sanheim as being like one of the guys who gets egged on by that dude. I never viewed Sanheim as being that dude. And I think in this game, he kind of was one of those dudes. And that was really cool because I don't expect that from him. And I'm, I'm saying this as someone who thinks very highly of Travis Sanheim. But to see Sanheim be the guy who, after John Tortorella probably threatened to kill their entire families in the locker room, to see Travis Sanheim be the first guy to go out there and be like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to go out there and be me and kick ass. For him to be the first guy to do that, like that was really cool to see. I almost wonder, and there's, I mean, it's Tortorella, but like a guy like him, you only have so many times to go to that well of kicking their ass. I almost wonder if he just comes in and goes, you know what the fuck you have to do, and walks out and doesn't say anything. That would be amazing. That would be so good. But also, like, it's him, and I can't imagine him having to discipline to hold his tongue. <laughs> like, not even discipline, like, no, like, the thought is in his head. Uh, I'm not even going to, they have to figure this out themselves. And he says, like, you know what you have to do, and goes to walk away and goes, but one more thing, and then screams <laughs> at them for five minutes. Like, I just, I would love to know what actually went on in the locker room after that. Uh, but yeah, Sanheim, like, yes, he was bad in the first period. Also, there's just something I have had, I just have to come to grips with, with Sanheim. In front of the net, he is going to be Shane Gostas Bear. Okay. And that's why they still need a badass to pair with him on the first pair. Like, that's why number one defenseman is not yet solved. They have top pair guy, but they don't have the yeah. dude who's just going to cross check you in the head rather than give up a goal. Fair. I thought it might be Phil Myers. I was dead wrong about that. Yeah, he's like a rotational seven in this league. Yeah, he's like an angel <laughs> like, guy, unfortunately. Yeah, like, he's just not that good. Oh, Phil. But, uh, oh, Phil. I, I, I really wanted it to be I Phil just, Myers. I really did. They were the perfect duo. They were so good. All right, uh, that's a perfect duo. Let's go for a perfect trio now before I give away the whole rest of the segment. Okay. It is time for Charlie O'Connor's three stars of the game. Let's start it off. Star number three. All right, uh, star number three, Travis Sanheim. And again, this goes in with the fact that I think he was horrific in the first period. I think he was one of the, I would say one of the worst players in the first period. But I think that they do not come back if Travis Sanheim does not take charge in the early second and then play an extremely strong game the rest of regulation, even into overtime. Uh, Sanheim is my number three because he had an extremely good 40 minutes of play. He absolutely did. Let's go to star number two. Star number two, Scott Lawton. Finally had the Scott Lawton game. Finally. We've been waiting for this for a while. You said earlier this week, is it possible that he is just kind of on the verge of being cooked? He's going to be turning 30 next year. Maybe that the fact that he isn't the most talented guy in the world, maybe he's on a severe downswing. We've seen it happen before with guys in their early 30s if they're not Claude Giroux, Sean Couturier type guys. 
tonight was a reminder that Scott Lawton still has it, that I think his recent swoon was just that, a swoon, a slump. And I, I, this, this served as confirmation for me that Lawton is going to bounce back and Lawton still has it. I thought Lawton was fantastic, especially obviously in the final two periods. You know, he, that fourth line was really good in those minutes. And to me, it was Lawton and Hathaway to a degree, but it was Lawton more than anyone else who was driving that. And I make him the second star because of that. Like Lawton, Hathaway, and random other badass. (laughs) And you, Delorier is one of my favorite guys on the team. On my Christmas wish list, it's more dance partners for Nick Delorier. I love it. Uh, but love like, if you. you had dude who was a little bit more hockeying, <laughs> that would be an awesome fourth line. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Star number one. Yeah, I mean, star number one is the guy whose name I don't even want to say. It's it's Patrick Kane. He was the best player on the ice. I, it sucks. I I, I <sighs> hate I hate to give him credit. Like, I, nice. it's one of those like drill tweets. Like, you know. You, you don't have to give it to him, yeah. but like I kind of second do, thought, I kind of <laughs> do have to give it to him. <laughs> Not gonna say the rest. Um, <laughs> he was really good. No, I mean it was. This is one of the first times Larkin has been back. I think it's his second game at home, third game back overall since um, looking like he was a corpse on the ice, and that that Ooh. was just like I I make a yeah, joke. That, no, that was that was like legitimately fucking it, horrifying. It was really scary. He looked yeah. like a dead body on the ice. Yeah, he's been back for three games now. Uh, that line is tremendous. I was very skeptical that Patrick Kane post hip resurfacing was going to have anywhere near the dynamic ability that he had pre-injury, especially after watching him last year with the Rangers. He looked like a shell of himself, and I was not confident that this surgery was going to fix him. I have not watched him super closely. He was not super impressive in the first game that they played against the, the Red Wings. Was it last week? Yeah. Tonight he he looked like old Patrick Kane. Yeah, that, he, I I am not a Patrick Kane fan for multiple reasons, but I have to acknowledge that he was he's everywhere tonight. Excellent at hockey. Uh, the second best number eighty eight, I think, of all time. I love that. Um, let's just do the uh, the diehard thing now because I don't want to put any reads or any advertisements near my outro in case like we have to cut it out because they go, you're fired if we keep this in. Beautiful. Uh, so, Charlie, you just wrote an article for the Die Hard. Sure and did. Listen, go to allphly.com, consume all of our content, and the free stuff is tremendous. But you just put out a, uh, it was this morning at like 3 a.m. That, yeah. that this showed up in Slack. Yep. Uh, an article about Sean Couturier. Is Sean Couturier truly back? And the only way you can read it is to go to allphly.com and sign up to be a Die Hard member. Die Hard members, when you sign up, you get the free t-shirt, as it says there. You get all of our paywall content. You get uh, discounts on all the events we throw. Like, we just had the takeover a couple of weeks ago. You would have got, like, 20 bucks off your Flyers ticket for that if you were a Die Hard, I think, was the discount. Like, it's a great value. And, I mean, it's Charlie O'Connor. You want his writing. Who else is diving this deep into shit like Charlie does? I, tell I, me a little about this article, but don't give anything yeah, away because yeah, they yeah. got to pay for it, cheapskates. Of course. And well, more or less okay, what it was sorry. was that – beautiful. Uh, more or less, I wanted to really dive into Sean Couturier's recent play in comparison to what he was in the years before he had the back injuries and before he had the two back surgeries. And – What was really striking the more I dove into it is just how much of his statistical resume has held from pre-back surgeries to post-back surgeries. Like legitimately, the only two things thus far, and he scored another goal tonight, he actually has two straight games with goals, right? Because he scored on Thursday as well. That were the really nice goal and close. Is it three? Is it three? Does he have three straight games with goals? Did he score on uh, on Tuesday as well? Or am I just thinking of... He definitely scored Tuesday and uh, Thursday and Friday. I might just be thinking of but anyway, back-to-back goals against. The point uh, being is yeah, that two in a row. Yeah. the the only two parts of his game statistically that have not yet come back are his finishing ability and his faceoff ability. And I had a long conversation with Couturier. Um, really, honestly, it was probably about a week and a half, two weeks ago, uh, about those two things because I dove into the numbers, and those are the two things that he still is not yet what he used to be. 
he gave me really, really insightful answers as to why he thinks he's still struggling in those regards and why he thinks he can get back to where he was. The face-off stuff, especially really interesting. One thing, and I'm not going to give it all away. One thing that I have never, I probably should have thought about this, but I've never really considered the impact that it has on face-off win percentage is the fact that, especially for someone like Couturier, who is such a hard worker, who probably studies everything about the game, Couturier basically said that one of the reasons why he thinks he's struggling on face-offs is because over the last year and a half, there's been a lot of turnover in terms of the linesman. Oh, and, he, oh. and he thinks... He, his thing is that he now has to learn the tendencies of an entire new generation of linesmen. It's all timing, so that makes sense. Like, like he, like he's probably spent his entire career figuring out like what the tendencies, like what millisecond the linesman drops the puck at each individual linesman, and now he's having to learn the tendencies of an entirely new set of linesmen, and he thinks that's part of why he's only a fifty percent faceoff guy as opposed to a fifty five percent faceoff guy like he was before the injury. And I like I don't want to discount uh, like the fact that G is gone. It's part of it. He's always he takes both now. And, he was and, only and, on his strong side before. And I did point that out in the article. However, one thing that's interesting about that is that his Couturier's surge in terms of getting to become a good faceoff guy, it actually happened the year before huh. he was paired with with Claude Giroux. So I do not doubt that that helped. However, I don't think that Couturier was just a product of Giroux. Oh, no. Because yeah. Couturier was already a 54, 55% faceoff guy the year before. Drew got moved to the wing because if you remember before 2017 2018 Drew and Couturier almost never played with each other aside from the power play because Drew was a center and Couturier was a center you only had two or three guys who could do that hockey exactly like he had he had Jake with G it was like well we can't have all three of them together yeah so yeah that but it was just it, it's an interesting he gave me a lot of interesting insights as to why he might be struggling thus far and as to why he thinks that give him some time and he will be a better face-off guy and he will also start finishing on his chances more over the last two games. He's finished on his chances a little bit more. Maybe we're already seeing the return of 14% shooting percentage Sean Gouturier already, maybe. Just a small sample of the type of insight you get when you go to allphly.com and become a diehard. And that just like that's just for the Flyers. Yeah. There's all the other sports too. There's really no reason not to do and, it. And, and a little teaser. Yeah. A little teaser. Ooh. I just may have edited it and began to prep a an article by our friend Alexander Appleyard about one Matve Michkov, the, the mad, mad Russian? Russian, that might just be out next week. So keep an eye out for that. And that will only be for diehards. You know, it would be something if we could get that secret thing that I don't want to say because I don't know when it's coming to coincide with that article. See, you know, we, we had the two things yeah, together. That's true. What, one of the benefits of having Alex Appleyard as a contributor is that I only know English. <laughs> Alex knows multiple languages and therefore Alex can interview players who do not like who their only language is not English. So this article may have interviews with people who know Mafe Mitchkov quite well, possibly because they might oh. be on his team. You might want to get ahead might of want the to check curve that out. and become a diehard member. You might want to check All that right. out. All uh, right, that sounds like a ton of fun. Uh, I just want to, because I took five minutes to do this, I want to read you <laughs> some of my Christmas wish list. I okay. didn't ask you to do it, so yeah, I'm not I don't gonna, have a Christmas I'm not going to tell list. you to come up with something on the spot. Uh, my first thing on my the Christmas wish list is sleep. Let's go home. Uh, <laughs> Samu Tuamala. Uh, he had a goal and an assist last night. It was his seventh multi-point game of the season. He didn't record a point tonight, uh, but he did have four shots on goal in what I think was a 5-4 shootout, shootout loss for the Phantoms. Is that Lizinski, what it was? Uh, yeah. Lizinski scored. There's some, uh, Lixell scored again, so there's some good stuff going on. I saw a comment earlier. I hope people are watching the Phantoms. I do, too. Now, I don't have the time for that. I simply don't. There's too much. <laughs> there's simply too much hockey, uh, NHL hockey, and too much wrestling out there. Uh, but it sounds like it's going well for the Phantoms. Uh, wish list number two. It, it's down the line. This is like when I do the game time read and say, buy someone a ticket to something, and then you have an event to look forward to. Cutter Gauthier, just bring him to me. Just bring him to me. I want to see him. You want Cutter uh, Gauthier. A first round pick for Sean Walker. That is on the list. 
The Lindros era black jerseys. When? When's it going to be I our don't, time? I don't like them. You don't like them? Not a fan. That's not a fan. But like the black jerseys they wear now. Yeah, they're not. You good have either. to acknowledge that the old ones are better. I would agree, but I I don't. What do you think of the 07 ish black jerseys? Also, well, I think you just don't like the black jerseys. My opinion is that the Flyers wear orange. The Flyers are orange. Right. Let's not mask the orange. That is my issue with the black jerseys. All right, uh, more dance partners for Nick Delorier. Nobody okay. nobody wants a piece. Nick Sealer's the only one, and he's on his team. Maybe we get one in practice, but I uh, yeah. know. A, uh, a power play quarterback. Man, if they had one, they'd be in the playoffs, no That'd problem. Be cool. It would be insane. And last but not least, a captain. Oh, I want to, no. I really died. I just thought that was a good, <laughs> it was a good way to end things. I, let, let, let me come up with a couple. Um, I will say more ice time for Jill Faraby. Ooh. Yeah, that, that, that is on the nice, wish list. Nice. Tyson Forrester figuring out how to score a ton of goals at the NHL level. He's so close. That would be fantastic. I would love that. And you know what? Let's say Cam York figuring out how to be a power play quarterback. I, I was going to put York figures it out, but then I was like, that's too specific. And I need to work yeah, in generalities with Hockey Santa. Yeah, I don't hockey care. Hockey Santa, I don't know if he can deliver exactly what I want. I have zero faith in Hockey Santa, so I'm <laughs> going to be as specific as possible because I don't expect he'll give me anything I want anyway. All right, and now it is time to close the show, and it is time to close the show in a traditional fashion. Some of you have probably heard this before, but it is uh, Canadian Poet Laureate Ricky LaFleur on What is Christmas? Sorry to interrupt, but I just had one of those brain learning things pop into my head that wasn't there a second ago, and it's about time to think in me around that basically, what is Christmas, you know? I just got out of jail, which was awesome, you know? <laughs> in jail, we don't have presents or lights or trees. We just get stoned and drunk, and it's the best time. And then I get out here, and I'm all stressed out. My girlfriend breaks up with me, and that's not what Christmas should be. It should be about getting stoned and drunk with your friends and family, people <laughs> that you love. Like, that's Christmas. None of the presents and lights and stress and shit. Just getting drunk and stoned with your friends and family, people that you love. Get drunk and stoned with your families. If you don't smoke joke, dope, if you don't smoke dope or drink, just spend time with your families. It's awesome. Merry Christmas. That'll do it for us tonight. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hanging out. Merry Christmas to you, Charlie. Merry Christmas, We will Phil. see you uh, next Wednesday, but until then, make sure you're subscribed everywhere. You know the whole spiel. My name is Bill Matz for Charlie O'Connor. Have a great holiday, Philly.